All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on the exciting topic of using AI in family history research. My name is Kathleen McKenzie, Education and Programming Manager here at American Ancestors, and I will be moderating today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is senior genealogist Melanie McComb. Melanie assists library visitors both on site and online with their family history research. Melanie holds a BS from the State University of New York at Oswego. She is an international lecturer who teaches on a variety of topics, including colonial through 20th century American military research, genetic genealogy, Atlantic Canadian, African American, Jewish, and Irish genealogy. She is also an honorary fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society. She has had articles published in American Ancestors Magazine and 50 Plus Advocate. She is also a blogger known as the Shamrock Genealogist. Now, we've all seen the headlines about artificial intelligence. This new technology seems to be able to do everything from producing complex digital images to creating songs. Uh, but have you wondered how it might be able to help you in your family history research? In this lecture, Melanie will discuss exciting possibilities for using AI to support your research, including assistance with report writing, digitally restoring family photos, and more. She will also address aspects of AI that genealogists should be cautious of, such as accuracy and copyright concerns. At any point during today's presentation, please do feel free to type your question into the Q&A panel found at the bottom of your screen. We'll address all of those questions at the end. There is no handout for this presentation today, but we are recording this event, and starting tomorrow, you can freely go back and review any of the content from this presentation on our website. So if you miss something during the live session, don't worry, you can always review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Melanie. Hey, thank you, and welcome everybody to this very exciting lecture on the late-breaking updates that AI is doing for genealogy. And you can imagine that this is quite mind-blowing, as this image likes to depict. This actually was generated by one of the AI tools called Bing Image Generator. And we'll talk about some of these different AI tools, um, but also we want to start off with just briefly, what is AI? So Oxford Dictionary actually has a definition for what is artificial intelligence. And it's defined as using the theory and development of computer systems, performing tasks that require human intelligence, which include things like what we know as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and translation between languages. So let's kind of just summarize what that means. It means that we're using machines that normally require human uh, intelligence, that reasoning, um, to be able to understand things that are being seen visually, um, how we speak, decisions that are being made, and even translating languages. And those can even include um, foreign languages as well, not specifically just using English. The idea of artificial intelligence goes all the way back to 1950 when Alan Turing had actually wrote an essay. He was a very well-known mathematician, and he had basically theorized that we as humans use different uh, ideas and technology and things to help us with those decisions. So as part of that, since we use all these different ideas, why couldn't we use technology such as computers to be able to help us to actually make those decisions or help us with certain tasks. It was in the mid-1950s when the first artificial intelligence tool was developed, um, which was known as logic theorist. And it was using, uh, it was actually solving mathematical problems using different symbols. 
And over time, we start to see that the original term of artificial intelligence was being started when that was coined by John McCarthy, who, along with Alan Turing and several others, are considered the, the fathers of AI. Computers, obviously, at this time were very, very expensive. We're talking, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands at times. So it wasn't until about the 1970s when we started to have them more affordable and they're actually more quicker to process data, which is key for using AI. The 1980s is when we start seeing that a lot of funding is starting to come in to develop these tools. And by 2000 is when we start seeing a lot of really key landmarks of AI coming out. And AI is ever-changing up to the minute. Um, even as early, late as yesterday, there was even a newer tool that was being launched. So this is obviously going to be changing over time as we try to keep up with all the new products that are being launched. Now, there are several different examples of different AI tools that are out there. One of the most common ones is known as a chatbot. So you may know this for tools like ChatGPT, and you might see this on other sites. This is when you can actually have a conversation with a, with this bot. So you're it's it's trying to act like you're talking to a person, but you're actually talking to a robot behind the scenes. And it's being used in many different areas, and not just genealogy, but a lot of customer service is using it. I can say even most recently, I had to use a chatbot when I was doing apartment hunting this fall, and all of that scheduling was taking place uh, with a chatbot. And then that information was then just forwarding over to the leasing office when I needed to, to go there. Um, I've seen a lot of cases being used in medical insurance um, and other areas too. So even Amazon has used AI as well. So they, how they work is you're basically providing um, some kind of prompt or question, and they have a lot of different frequently asked questions or responses that they usually have given based on different patterns for humans. And because you're using a different robotic tool, they actually are more accessible and available 24-7, reducing the need for staff for some of these more uh, more tedious tasks, such as doing things like scheduling or understanding maybe um, some frequently asked questions. They also can personalize recommendations. So depending on how, how intelligent the bot has been created, you, it can actually give you very customized suggestions based on what you are prompting it with. So it's as good as the, you give the question back to it as well. So as I mentioned, ChatGPT is one of the most common chatbots you've probably heard of, but there are others out there. Google came out within the last year or so with BARD. There is Bing Chat, which is by Microsoft, which is done on the Microsoft Edge browser. There's also one called Claude, which I only recently just learned about yesterday in a legacy webinar on AI. IBM's Watson Assistant has been out for a bit now. That's being used more by businesses. There's even a one that's used by HubSpot, which is also used by businesses for sales and other customer service called Chatspot. And there's so many more. If you just Google AI chatbot, you will come up with many different models out there. So let's give you an example of how a chatbot might look. So this is ChatGPT, which is on the website OpenAI, uh, because it is being more of an open code being used versus from a private company. And so in this example here, I wanted to give it a prompt. So I typed in, uh, help me plan a four day trip to Prince Edward Island. And as you can see above, you can do many different options. You can ask it to create web pages, write text messages. Um, it can recommend activities. It can give you code snippets. It can do a lot of things. So you have to kind of tell it a command and see if it can do it because they keep changing it. But in this example, let's start with something simple and let's get a suggestion, a suggestion for an itinerary off to Canada. 
So all I've done is ask for a four day trip to Prince Edward Island. And it's basically going to give you enthusiastically saying, absolutely. It's a beautiful destination. And here's a suggested itinerary for a four day trip and even breaks down by day from the time of arrival to departure of things you could do during that time. So this could be something that you may want to, you know, explore if you're trying to visit a new area um, so that you can understand what, uh, what capabilities you could have. Now, obviously, it's going to give you just some suggestions in this case for a trip. So it may not be able to give you a specific like restaurant you should go to. In the suggestion of day one, it tells you enjoy a delicious seafood dinner at a local restaurant. Okay, it doesn't tell you which one to go to. So unless something is more widely known on the on the internet, um, it's going to give you more broader suggestions. But it could be a good way to get started with a basic task like this. So and then it finishes up, it goes through the next few days, and then it even gives you some additional tips at the bottom. So it might give you some suggestions on you know, restaurants to try or where you should drive or different events that you're going to. Um, so other types of AI tools that are out there besides the chatbots are including things like translations. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later like with using Google Translate. But being able to translate uh, different languages from text or images, um, uh, documents, etc. cetera. Um, there also are AI tools to help you with social media. So I've actually been using some features um, using the, the platform Buffer, and they even have the ability to help you write content for social media. So that might be an interesting area if you are trying to um, create enough uh, buzz for your business or your brand to help you with that, or maybe create content calendars. There also are image generators, and these are the more amusing ones that I've seen around the internet, because you might see cases where someone will ask for a prompt of a particular um, image. I saw a really particularly fun one where there was a woman that was putting uh, cats in her tree, and she kept and they kept prompting her to say, okay, now she's getting more cats. She's adopted all these cats. And and it, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then eventually it gets to be the, 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 the tree has become the cat and it's swallowing her whole. So they could get a little outlandish at times, but just to give you an idea that you can basically start with a very basic image using things like Bing image or Dolly, um, and then actually add on to it and ask them to refine that image. You know, maybe if you're trying to add uh, different characters in there or different feelings um, to generate a different image you're looking for. There also are uh, writing assistants. Um, I've actually been using Grammarly for a few, uh, about a month now, and that's been helpful with just helping to correct uh, basic grammar and spelling errors. Um, also, it helps you with um, a pro proceeding with confident tones in your writing. So if you're writing either on email or social media or other documentation, it could be a nice way to kind of cross check that in real time without actually having to go to a separate spell or grammar check in your word processor. So let's talk about specifically how can AI be used for genealogy since that's where why, why all of you are here. So there are just some examples I'm gonna give here. And obviously this is not an exhaustive list, but it can help you with providing you with some research assistance on different types of records you may wanna look for. It can do summarizations and extractions of text of a document. You can repair and colorize photographs. You can translate records into other languages. You can transcribe and index handwritten records, newspaper articles, create ancestor biographies, and so much more. So for an example, let's start off with maybe a question you might have for one of these chatbots. So I'm going to start with ChatGPT. So my question I asked it was, where can I find Oaths of Allegiance records for Massachusetts? Now, Oaths of Allegiance records, depending on the context, could be in different areas. It could be concerning citizenship, or maybe it's concerning something during like the Revolutionary War when you had to prove that you were swearing an oath 
um, toward the, the newer government here. So it kind of gives you kind of a vague response, but it tells you, okay, you know, the, uh, for Massachusetts, you should contact the Massachusetts State Archives, um, but knowing that it could be in multiple, you know, records and to contact them. And otherwise you should, con you should go through genealogy platforms. So it's going to give you a more of a broad response. It's not going to necessarily say, yep, here's the database you should go to and this is what you can, you can do that. And that's because a lot of the platforms are not always hooked up to the internet. So they're not going to be necessarily real time um, suggestions for some of that. And also they can't access sites where they require a login for. So things like family search uh, do have at least a username and password you need to get in. So it's not going to be smart enough to be able to tell you exactly here's where you need to go. But it gives you an idea of a starting point of like, here's the type of places that you should find this record. So I wanted to try a different uh, technique with using ChatGPT. And this is it regarding using the summarization and extraction features. So I said, okay, let's see if we can analyze two census records. Now, before I really got into um, seeing that it wasn't hooked to the internet, I still just gave it a shot. I said, great, I have two census records from Ancestry. Can you analyze them? And then unfortunately it says, I can't directly access them on websites like Ancestry, but if you provide me with the key details, I will analyze them. Please share names, dates, locations, or other pertinent information from the records. So it is telling you what it's expecting. So you, what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you're staying within that same chat and then adding on to it. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna, gonna then start to actually add in the details from those census records. So how we do that is we go into the site maybe where we found the census, and that could be on FamilySearch, American Ancestors, Ancestry, any other platform you have, and you want to basically copy and paste those details into ChatGPT. So you could just go right to the record and then just basically paste out that transcription that you want. And then you're going to then ask the platform, the, the bot, to compare against another record and paste those details in. And it helps when they're the same type of record because then it's comparing apples to apples. So I basically pasted in the census details for a distant cousin of mine uh, for the 1930 U.S. Census when they were li living in Waltham, Massachusetts. So I just basically just took that information straight out of Ancestry on the record page and just copied it all the way out. And I want to make sure that I'm keeping the name of the census, so 1930 census, and who the subject is. In this case, it's Patrick Chasen. And then I continue with all the way through because the record obviously is long. It goes into the other fields, such as, you know, mother and father's birthplace, occupation. So you want to do all of that and all of the household members as well. So I had the wife, the daughter, and then I even had some, uh, I had the a brother as well. So I kind of continue to always add that. So that's why you see it kind of going over into the other side. And what it does is it says, okay. Here's a snapshot of his household summarizing what you just pasted. And what I like about this is that it nicely bolds those key areas. And in some cases, it actually does a little bit of analysis. So it kind of tells you like things like, oh, you know, he filed his first papers under naturalization. He's in the process of becoming a citizen. Um, you know, um, he rented a home on Bright Street with a low home value of $30. They owned a radio set. Um, you know, it's, it starts to summarize a lot of the details here, which is nice. And then it continues on. It goes through the rest of the family members. So you have the wife, you have, and you have the, the children, and you even have a brother of Patrick's noted there as well. It then even gives you a little bit of a summary, just saying that, okay, so here's their, where they're living. Um, Patrick is a carpenter working in building contracting. He arrived in the U.S. around 1921 and was in the process of naturalization. He had his wife, his two daughters, and his brother in the household, and they lived at a rented house with modest belongings indicated by the low home value. And they seem to maintain a connection to their French heritage because of the language spoken at home. So it even gives you a nice little summary narrative about that record of maybe how you might interpret it.
then what I wanted to do is I wanted to prompt it. So now I need to prompt it by saying, okay, compare their change in status with the, with the 1940 census um, for Patrick and his family. So now we're basically saying that, okay, that we are trying to compare the value here uh, for Patrick. And we're saying, okay, here's the details now for the next census. And we wanna do the same exercise. We wanna paste all that again. So we paste that, we paste it all the way through. We go all through all the relatives there. We have the wife and we have more children that are being noted. And you know, the tool is like, certainly, here's the comparison of the values here. So it's summarized here we are in 1930. And here, and we see that, you know, yep, here he is. He's renting, you know, a home with a value of $30. So that's probably the month, that's probably the monthly rent that they're paying at that time. And then we're comparing it against the 1940 census. And it's still saying, yep, he's still a carpenter, but now we have the number of hours a week he's uh, working and how much income he's making. So, which is, was not noted in the previous one. It also notes here that in addition to his wife, Mary, there were several additional children. So besides Marguerite and Rita, who we already had before, we also had at least uh, with several other children, Mary, Doris, uh, John, Patricia, and Joseph. And it even notes though, that they're on a different street now. Um, and it seems that their rental cost that they're paying per month has gone down. It then goes on to give you even more observations. So it is showing you that, yes, there's been a change in the family size. There are now additional daughters and, and, and sons that are accounted for. Um, now, one thing to note, though, is it says, it says a son, even though there's two listed. So it doesn't quite get that exactly right. But at least it does try to summarize the names of the people there. Um, it notes their occupation and income changes, showing that maybe he might have made a little more money, but we also didn't have the income on the previous one. And the home details showing that they were paying less rent um, based on that comparison. So, and then it summarizes with saying that the most significant changes were is obviously his family has grown with more children being born uh, between those records and that perhaps maybe he has had some more stability in his work hours based on working over 40 hours um, in that case possibly and that he moved to a different home could have been some kind of change of circumstances now a lot of people that were immigrants that were renting um, a lot of them did relocate to different apartments when the lease uh, ran out so we don't know why he they moved but you know, they, they try to suggest that maybe something happened why they decided to move to a different uh, apartment. Another uh, chatbot that's out there is Claude. And this is a recent one that I learned about uh, through Legacy's webinar yesterday. And I've been really having fun playing with it. I find it very interesting. What I like about Claude is that it allows you to actually upload attachments. So when you're trying to ask for some kind of prompt, you can actually attach a PDF, a text file, a CSV file. Um, there is a size limit of 10 megs. So you need to keep in mind that you can't have something terribly large, but you could do like a page at a, a couple pages at a time as needed and then um, to keep adding to it. So I think this is a really good tool when you're trying to take documentation to do that summary and extraction, especially if you just don't have the time or have it available to copy and paste, because sometimes you might be dealing with a very large file. So um, this is what the, the tool looks like. It's uh, run by Anth Anthropic. That's the name of the company behind it. So, um, and I can ask it different things and it's very similar to ChatGPT. Um, and something I, I tried out was to summarize a document. So I thought, let's try that out because that sounds interesting. Um, a lot of times we might be dealing with different uh, scholarship that's come out and we may not have the time to go through and actually have time to really read it very thoroughly. So maybe I just want a summary of what that document says. So a popular place I like to go for uh, different like journal articles and things like that are um, an academia.edu. Uh, There's a lot of interesting articles people write across different areas. Um, so one of the articles I had read recently was, it was called What's in an Irish Surname? And it was about Connolly's 
the Connolly surname and other Irish surnames. And I basically asked Claude to summarize this document with the key points. And then I attached the PDF to it. And within just like a couple seconds, I got this nice summary here that lets me know that this essay is looking at digitized records from the 1901 and 1911 census. And it was looking at the regional distribution of where these surnames were and how Connolly was even, you know, derived from two different Gaelic names um, and even where it was dis uh, distributed. So it noted they were in South Kilkenny, um, et cetera. So then I wanted to do a follow up and say and just see if there was anything relevant. So I wanted to ask, well, did the article discuss the presence of the surname Connolly in County Monaghan, Ireland? Because that's where I have a lot of my Irish. So I wanted to see if this article was going to be having potentially relevant to me. And it does. It says, yes, it does discuss the presence of the surname Connolly in County Monaghan. And this is a, a follow up I've done. And it lets me know that, yes, it was most numerous in the counties of Galway, Cork, Monaghan, Dublin, and Antrim, most common with 15.8 per 8, 8, 15, 8 point, 15 .8 per thousand population, um, et cetera. And so it summarizes a couple key details. So this could be another feature you could use when you're trying to just summarize maybe research that is out there. Another tip I want to show is how you can extract information from a newspaper article. And I know a lot of you have written in and were curious on how you can do this. Maybe you have like an obituary or some other article and you want to see if there's an easier way to extract out this information. And in short, yes, there is. So what you want to do is you want to locate what's known as the OCR text, otherwise known as optical character recognition. This is how computers can read different uh, things by, by looking at the symbols or the words on an image and they try to make them into different shapes or letters. So, and most newspaper sites use some form of OCR um, because it is a quicker and easier way to get this information out there without having someone to manually go through and transcribe, which would probably take at least four or five times the time. And so what you want to do is you, when you locate that text, you want to copy it into your prompt on your platform. So like ChatGPT or Claude or one of the other ones. And you want to ask it to extract out the necessary information and summarize it for you. So what I did is I went into uh, newspapers.com and I located an obituary for one of my extended relatives for Michael J. Connolly. And I wanted to go to, since I'm on newspapers, I went to the clip feature and most sites allow you to do some kind of clipping or you can use your computer and use the snipping tool, especially on, on like Microsoft. And I think maybe Macs have that as well. And once we go to the clip, that's when we can get to the OCR text. So I've clipped the article, it's coming out of the Boston Globe. And then what I wanna do is I want to scroll down to the bottom of the page. From there, I can see the OCR text. And it doesn't look like much, and there obviously are gonna be some spelling errors and, and things like that for formatting. What you want to do is you want to copy that information out. And once you have that, you want to then go into your chat platform. And this was a suggestion I really liked that Stephen Little shared yesterday on Legacy's webinar. He said you want to prompt the chat bot with what role they're taking on. So he made a suggestion of saying, acting as a professional genealogist, um, to set the tone so that it can talk to you like a genealogist. So I typed, as a, as a professional genealogist, extract the relationships of the people in the below obituary text, and I put a note there, correct for spelling, so knowing there might be some spelling errors, and summarize. And then I just basically just put a my colon, and then I and then I pasted in the information from the OCR text. Then I clicked the, the little icon there to come back to me with results. 
and it comes back and here it tells me, here you go. Here are the extracted relationships in summary. Michael J. Conley was the husband of Mary B. Walsh and the father of all of his children named. And they included the uh, the married names for the daughters as well. Um, and, and, and again, it just kind of summarizes the note there. Mary's the wife of Michael Connolly. So if there was other spouses, they potentially might be in that bullet. And then it notes the children as another bullet again. And then it summarizes saying the obituaries for Michael J. Connolly. He was married to Mary B. Walsh and they had eight children, Evelyn, Rita, Joseph, Loretta, Gerard, Francis, James, and Mary. So what happens if you don't have the OCR text? Well, there actually are ways to get the OCR and you can do that with a free tool. So there are tools out there that you can find through Google, um, such as ones like OCR Online, which I'll show you. Um, you can even do this from like different tools um, available through Google or Adobe. They might have other products as well that might be a little bit fancier. But if you just want a quick and dirty way to get the, uh, the OCR text, I can show you how to do that. So this was a, a very long obituary sample, the last part of it. It was pretty much an entire column in a newspaper in Prince Edward Island, Canada. Uh, for some of my uh, second grade grandparents, Michael and Mary Rooney. And I wanted to use this part of the extract because this is where it lists the different uh, surviving relatives and the pallbearers. So these are going to be the most popular place that you're going to look for names when you're trying to prove relationships. And I had this on a different site. This was on a Canadian uh, uh, newspaper site, islandnewspapers.ca. Um, there wasn't really an easy way to get the OCR. So um, so what I needed to do was I had to actually select the file on step one. And what I did is I had already saved the file as a JPEG. So I selected the file. I browsed to that file on my computer. And then I made sure I had the right language. So if you have a different language, you can account for that. And you can put the format of where how you want it. Do you want it in Word? as a docx, do you want as a PDF? There are many different options you can have. And then you wanna click convert. And then at the bottom there is the OCR text. So that OCR text now could be copied into a platform uh, to actually generate that summary. And you could even download that output file as well. So same idea we did before. I said, acting as a professional genealogist, extract the details from the obituary below. And I just pasted everything as it was and then went ahead and, and moved forward. And this was done using Claude. And here are the key details that were extracted. So you have name of the deceased. Now, they weren't quite exactly right because actually it was uh, Rooney, not Hooney. And I'll show you how you can correct that. But it does give you everything else. You got the spouse, you got the children's name. Um, it even notes that there were 70 grandchildren and 30 great-grandchildren, so that might be something that might have been overlooked. Uh, the different siblings, um, and then even down to the pallbearers, which can be a really interesting way to do that fan club approach or, you know, uh, family associates and neighbors. Now, here's a key on how you can correct for those, some of those spelling errors, is that what I missed doing in my prompt was I didn't add the person's name that was the subject for it, which was Michael and Mary Rooney. So you want to add that into your prompt, into your question, to help guide the computer to let them know that, well, no, it's not Hooney, it's Rooney. And for the most part, when I did that, so I did, so I did the same uh, prompt, act as a special genealogist, extract the details from the obituary below from Michael and Mary Rooney. And I pasted everything just like I did. So for the most part, it got better. So we have Michael and Mary Rooney. It lists the name of the wife and husband correctly, and even the children. Um, it did have one sibling at the bottom that did say Mrs. Hooney, but for the most part, everybody, and Philip Hooney is the brother, but for the most part, most of the errors were fixed. It's not going to be 100%, but it does get better. Okay. Another type of tool that's out there is Google Translate. 
and which has been around a bit. And this has a lot of different uses because whether you want to take some text and just copy and paste it and just find out a quick translation for something, if you wanted to um, take pictures um, using your mobile, you can use even what's known as the Google Lens app. So like street signs or different documents. Um, you can even use Google Translate to talk to someone in real time in different languages and to help understand what they said and to take what you're saying and translate back to them in their language. So there's a lot of good features here and already they're already up to 133 languages, which is really impressive. Um, you could even use this to translate whole websites as well. You may have seen this if you've used like Google Chrome where it may try to automatically translate a website if it's not in your native language um, and basically ask you if you want to look at that link, look at that website in that translation. So a lot of it is working behind the scenes too. So let's take a little case study of how we can use Google Translate for some genealogy civically. So this is the Google Translate tool, how it's set up. Um, it's going to try to detect any languages on the left-hand side. You can even use your microphone to speak into it um, so that it can hear what it's trying to say and it'll try to interpret that. You can copy and paste text. You can use images, uh, upload documents um, and websites. So let's say I was trying to uh, translate a record that I had found on Family Search. Uh, I, I went into the Italian records, and this is an atti di morte, apologies for my pronunciation, uh, an act of death or a death record. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to see if I could translate this record because maybe perhaps I'm not a native Italian speaker. So I would go to click on download to download the image of that record. And from there, when you go back into Google Translate, which um, is under the Google tools, translate.google.com, I want to go to select images, and then you could either drag and drop that image, or you can browse it or paste from your clipboard. So I'm just going to do browse for my files. So I'm just going to browse and get it from my downloads. And from there, what you want to do is you want to make sure that detect language, if it doesn't pick up automatically on it, you want to select the language the record is in. And sites like FamilySearch are really good for telling you what language records are in. Um, and then you want to make sure on the right hand side, it tells you what language you want it to be in. In this case, I wanted to be, be converted to English. Now here, it's actually given me the real time translation based on this. And obviously, it's not going to be 100% with spelling or with grammar and syntax, but at least it gives you an idea of what it's trying to say. So you can see at least if it's if it's for your person and what relevant information is there. There's also an option under detect language where it says show original. That lets you actually put it side by side. And that can be really good if you're trying to decipher word for word um, how the translation is, because then you can have the original on the left, the original record, and then the translation on the right. And then you could try to ma match up the two to see what it's trying to say, because that will give you that context. As I mentioned, there is Google Lens, which works in conjunction with that translate feature. Uh, this is a mobile app that you can use, um, and it's available through the Google Play Store and the Apple Store. Um, that you can put on your phone. And I really like using it. I've actually used it for things like um, gravestones. So for example, um, half of my family is Eastern European uh, Jewish. So I like to, so I have Hebrew gravestones that I have photographs of. So I can even use that to help translate the gravestone uh, photograph using my phone. And it doesn't have to necessarily be something in real time right in front of the grave. I could take a picture of it right from Find a Grave or another site and see what the translation is trying to tell me. And that gives me some good clues because for Hebrew gravestones, as many of you may know, is that you're going to get the father's name on them. 
Other tools that are being used are being leveraged by a lot of the big players as well, including Family Search. Family Search has been using a handwriting recognition tool, and they very much have been using a lot of them with uh, Spanish records recently because they found that it's been largely expediting the amount that they can get out there to index than if they were to try to do it the the, the previous way. And what's good about that tool is it knows when it it's not sure of a, of a particular transcription. So it basically flags the different fields where it needs a review. And a lot, a lot of times that's the name. It's their first and last names and maybe other data that needs to be checked by a human. So Family Search has, this tool is called Get Involved. It allows you to actually see what the computer is flagging as a potential error in the file. And they're asking you to confirm if it's correct or not. And if it's not, you can actually submit those edits. So let's show you what that looks like. So when we're on the familysearch.org website, you want to go up to the very top toolbar between memories and activities. You then want to click on get involved. And obviously you want to make sure you're logged in. So, and then when you kind of scroll down that page, it, it gives you this explanation of how this works. And it, here's an example. So there's an example of a page uh, the name Juan is highlighted in yellow, and it's asking you, is this Juan? And then you could say either yes or no, or skip if you're unsure. And once you feel confident, you know you're ready to do this, um, you can then go to name review. And then it'll give you maybe like 20 or so at a time. So it, it can be very done very quickly. So what you may want to do is you may want to find what types of records you're interested in. So what country are you curious about? And maybe what uh, state or province or other area you want to go into. So in this case, I'm going to look at United States records. And I'm actually going to go into New York. So I'm going to select New York from that drop down. And one of the projects that it brought me to is Index to Deeds, uh, a grantee index for Franklin County, New York. So these are people buying land um, at this time. And what's what I like about this particular project is they're trying to digitize these different indexes, like the grantor or grantees, because these will help you know that there is a record out there so you know you can get to the original record like the deed. So it presents the record that you that I need you to review the names, and it's going to highlight in blue the name that you they want you to review. So it's highlighting this name of Gagandors. So we want to obviously zoom in and see if that sounds like that's accurate based on what the letters look like. And well, not quite. So that what looks like Gagandors to the computer is actually Sagendorf. So we can actually click the edit button at the bottom here instead of checking off that it's a match. And we can then write over Gagendorf and put in Sagendorf. So that's so once you paste that in there, knowing that's under an edit, you then click submit. And now it's going off to the computer saying that there's been a change that's been made. My heritage has been releasing out of. Excuse me. My heritage has been releasing out a lot of AI tools, and one of them is even more recently released, I think as of the last couple of weeks, AI Biographer. So I'm going to talk about some of those tools that have come out. So one of the tools that was released and not too long ago, too, is AI Record Finder. So one of the questions that we got was, how do I find um, records that relate to my genealogy um, you know, that might be more useful. Well, I think when we start seeing these AI platforms across some of the larger sites, this is a way to narrow down on getting more genealogical records. So let's talk about how it, how it, how it works. So you can choose the conversational style that you want to use, whether formal or casual, and then it's going to ask you for some basic information. So you want to put in a first and last name of an individual, along with any birth or death dates, locations, or relatives, knowing that you're looking for a particular person. If you want to, you could even change the style to casual, so on how you want to interact with your bot. So 
This way you can actually identify if, you know, if that's a little bit easier to do it. So you can choose the style of the tone that you use. A lot of the sites that are coming out especially are gonna have these consent features, which I think are really important because when a lot of the AI platforms were done, um, there was a lot of issues with copyright concerns and how data was being used. So it is letting you know that this you are conversing with a bot um, to find records and that the information you enter um, is processed and used by the AI to provide you with the search results. And it's held for continuity between sessions for no longer than six months. And it says, don't submit any sensitive personal information in the chat. So keep in mind that when you are searching things, you are adding information into that data as well. So keep that in mind. So you need to agree to it to use the platform. So let's say I wanted to start off with a question on finding someone. I said, please enter the first and last name of the person you want to find along with any additional details. I said, I want to find my second great grandfather, Ignati Galunas. He was born circa 1870 in Lithuania. He lived in Riga, Latvia in 1914. He was the father of Anton Galunas. So I'm giving some context here on who he is. And the system goes out and it tries to find records that are going to exist on the MyHeritage site. So it's looking for things like if that person is in a MyHeritage family tree, are they in the family search family tree that is being shared, um, city directories, etc. So in this case, it's saying, okay, we found four records that might pertain. There's one you can't see offhand. <clears throat> The top record indicates a marriage to Joanna Galunas with one son named Anton. So it's kind of trying to point you to that that might be a very useful record to look into. It's actually my tree, but if it wasn't my tree, this might be a way of having some type of cousin bait that you're trying to find potential relatives that you are related to. So because they don't have the actual record for him, I said, well, does my heritage have a death record for Latvia? knowing that we can't necessarily find maybe a record for him directly, but is there a record that we can search on in my heritage? And the tool tells you, yes, they do have death records from Latvia in their collection. Um, you need to provide as much information as possible to find the search, just an approximate year, et cetera. So it does tell you that there are some collections that you could get into. So that's another way that AI can be really useful in, the, in this scenario. Um, if you go enter my heritage and you go enter my photos under photos, I'll show you another tool here as well. So the tool that came out is the photo estimator. So I had uploaded uh, this photograph that was actually colorized as well uh, with my heritage using uh, the photo estimator here. So he's an extended cousin that we were passed down this photograph and they'll provide you with an estimated year. So in this case, it's estimating that this was taken approximately 1945. And if you click into it, it even gives you a confidence level of how of what why they think it's probably how close to 100% they think it is. So it's about 77% confident, and it's giving you an error gap of about plus or minus six years. So that's not too bad. And then you can choose if you want to save that estimate or reject it. So this could be a way if you were trying to identify how old a photograph is, um, you can use this tool and it automatically shows up once you upload those photographs to MyHeritage. So it was pretty close actually. Horace Joseph was actually killed on D-Day in June of 1944. So that photograph was, was probably taken within a year or two um, before his death. So it's pretty pretty accurate I would say. So you may want to try other photographs to see how accurate you're finding it to be. Another tool I'll show you is if you go under family tree and you go to my family tree. This is the latest feature and we're going to talk about the AI biographer. So I'm going to locate some relatives of mine. In this case, I'm locating my third great grandfather, James McKenna, who was born in Ireland and died in Prince Edward Island. Once I click into that profile, if I scroll down on the left-hand side on that little toolbar, it gives you the option to create an AI biography. So what you do is you then click that link, 
and it's going to ask you if you want a standard bio or if you want an enhanced bio. So do you want information that's only based on what you've given them in the tree, or do you want them to potentially give you other details from other matching records on MyHeritage and maybe elsewhere on the web? So I decided to choose the enhanced, and then I clicked Create AI Biography. From there, it tells me your AI biography is going to be ready in a few minutes, and we'll send you an email once it's ready. You can decide to stay on the screen, and then the screen will tell you when it's ready, or you can just check your email when it comes in. I found that uh, when I did this the other day, it took me maybe between five or 10 minutes tops. So I see that it's ready, um, and you can click view. It's also going to send it as a PDF to your email as well. So it gives me a bit of a summary. So again, it's going to summarize the key details, such as your, your birth, your death, any parents, siblings, spouse, and children, all details that are coming out from my tree. Where it gets in interesting is that when it gets into the biography, so it starts to give me this narrative. So I see that he was born about 1821, 22 in Donick Mo County, Monaghan, Ireland to Mr. McKenna, and he had a brother named Owen with his birth and death dates. It mentions his marriage and his children. Um, incidentally, it also mentions that additionally records indicate three other children. So that's a sign that there's probably something being added um, to, to that record that you may want to look at. Because it's noting that there's three children that are coming out later. And then he, they also mentioned at some point, James McKenna lived in Glasgow, Scotland in 1851. And I thought that's kind of strange. Why is he all of a sudden going from Prince Edward Island to Scotland? Usually it's the other way around. They went from Scotland or Ireland to Canada. So we may want to look into that a little further. And then it mentions his death date. On the next page, it even gives you some historical context about what's going on. And obviously, you want to make sure you really fact check this to make sure this is sounding accurate. This one actually turned out to be pretty accurate. So it's letting me know about, about different unrest going on in Ireland with all the penal laws, discrimination against the Catholics, that he they had left pretty much uh, early on before the famine was really starting to hit in Ireland. Um and had suggested that maybe he did go to Scotland, and this was when he was going through a lot of industrialization and what, what the conditions were like. So it gives you a little bit of context about what life might have been like, what the area was. So some interesting food for thought. Now, the final page is where you want to really look more in detail. Besides just giving you the summary of their surname origins, you want to pay attention to those consistency issues. So it's noting maybe if there's a potential change in dates that you want to pay attention to. So the year of birth being off by a year or two, not too worried about that. Rose Kelly's year of birth seems like they're trying to suggest that basically another record says she's born in 1826, 1819. So we may want to look at that. That's a little more of a spread. Um, but it does note that there are discrepancies in the number of names of children and that there are three other children appearing. And again, there's that 1851 residence. Where is that coming from? Well, if you look in the citations, there's a citation for the 1851 Scotland census collection on my heritage. So they're trying to point you to that record that they pulled in as part of that enhanced biography. So we take a look at that record. We can click on that link actually and go right to it. And so I can see that there is a transcription of the original census, uh, James McKenna. He lived in Glasgow, um, in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, he lived on Main Street. He was married. He was a laborer. And he was born in Ireland. So, okay, maybe. So we want to look at the other children and the wife, too. Well, we do have James and Rosie, but the children's names don't all match up. And if you notice, the years are off, too. So we don't think that this is actually our record, but this can be a really interesting exercise to see if there's a way that these platforms can pull in records that potentially might be a hint for you. And then you could decide whether you add that to your tree or not. So in this case, I'm going to reject it. You can also find these other AI biographies under the, the photos and under albums. There's going to be a separate area where all these AI biographies can be kept. You also can see if there's a biography by looking at the profile that is attached to them if you generated one. So let's talk briefly about what AI can't do for genealogy, because it can't do everything. 
first off, it really can't replace your genealogy research. And one thing I'll note, though, too, is that the subscription sites, when I say they can't be searched, I mean that unless the platform you're using is actually hooked up to the Internet for real time uh, data, you're going to get those error messages like you saw before with ChatGPT, where it says, I can't search Ancestry, but if you tell me what you want me to look at, I'll analyze it for you. Some sites will let you do this, but for the most part, most times the platforms are going to say, I can't look outside for this. You need to basically bring the data to me. Um, it also really can't do a full organization of your genealogy files. There may be other software or things you can do to clean up your files on your computers, but that's going to take a lot more time and thought. So it's not going to be something you want a computer to try to do for you, and it's just going to be too much of an exercise and data to do that. And they also are very clear on they cannot analyze your DNA results. They may be able to give you basic, you know, summaries of how DNA is used and relationships, but they you can't just say, here's my DNA, figure out who my great-grandfather is. It can't do that. So you need actual uh, persons like myself that do that kind of analysis. So, and also something to keep in mind, though, is a lot of these platforms, especially if they're not genealogy ones, like in my, in my heritage, if you ask them about a specific person that maybe is not a notable, it can't really help you. So it may give you an idea of where you should go next, but it can't, it can't give you the answer. There is no magical platform that can tell you everything about everybody. It doesn't exist. So I had asked, where, when did Ignani Galunas, who was born in Lithuania, when did he die in Riga, Latvia? And it says, I don't have access to this real-time information. My last update was in January 2022. So again, it's not up to date. And it says that you might need to go to different archives um, in both Lithuania and Latvia and to do more research. So it's basically giving you an idea of, like, you need to do genealogy research. Another thing to note, though, too, is that, and this has happened for many genealogists that have been playing with the different platforms, is that sometimes you may get what's called a hallucination where the tool might just make up a fact or source and it sounds very convincing but it's really not and we'll get into that with some of the legal concerns but you got to be really careful with some of the information that's come out you don't want to rely on it as complete fact so let's talk about those copyright and other legal concerns before we go to questions so there's a lot of uh, rulings that are going on right now to decide if AI can a copyright be issued. And as of August of this year, it was decided by U.S. District Judge Beryl Howell that, um, that only human authors who have created works can receive copyrights. So if it's generated by a computer, it doesn't qualify. And this was based on an application that was done by a computer scientist, Stephen Thaler, who had developed a tool where he was creating all these different patents for inventions. And the copyright office is like, hmm, sorry, you didn't actually create that. The computer did. So we can't honor that and give you those patents because you didn't create them yourself. It's even getting into the Supreme Court where they're even looking at potential AI issues, especially when it comes into the legal field, because if, as we know, we may, it's maybe tempting to look at asking AI all these questions. Well, there have actually been a few cases where some lawyers have actually been burnt by that. And what I mean by that is, well, there was actually a lawyer that had wrote legal briefs into ChatGPT that had citations for fictitious court cases that never happened. And he got a nice uh, slap on the wrist and a $5,000 fine there, um, basically said, don't do that again. And there's a lot of ethics um, that are going out, especially in law schools right now, to say, you know, we understand it's tempting to, um, to use this to finesse your reports and everything too, but it's a tool, but it should not be replacing, you know, your knowledge and, and your and your reasoning for everything. So you need to make sure you're doing valid research. So these are my tips that I have, and I'm sure I might revise these or add more as AI continues to evolve. You want to make sure you're aware that AI can and will likely make mistakes. And a lot, of the, a lot of the sites will actually tell you that up front and say, you know, pretty much be aware that you will likely get a mistake in something you, you ask it. 
you don't want to rely on a computer to do all of your analysis. It's fine to do a quick summary like I was doing with maybe like an obituary analysis or a census analysis. But I would say you don't want to give it a very complex amount of math to do because it could be very easy where something could be misinterpreted and could throw off all your data. If you're a professional genealogist, you don't want to use AI to generate reports. It's not, it's not, it's not ethical. It could be plagiarized data that's coming from elsewhere where that data is coming from. You want to make sure you're putting your own words on something. And also, a lot of places, including social media, are, are trying to ask people that when you're using AI to present material like an image or text, you should try to say that up front as much as possible so that people could understand when an image is real or not. I will say that especially as we're dealing with a lot of international conflicts, um, especially in the Middle East and things like that, AI is a very exciting thing, but it could be scary if it's used in the wrong hands and we don't want to spread misinformation. So just think about that when you're using AI that you are being very clear on, give a citation of where this information comes from and how is it generated. So in review, AI is a very large and evolving field that is changing minute by minute. There are a lot of tools that are out there. And it's hard for me to say that there's one tool you should use. There's different tools for different goals. So you need to try out which one it works best for you. Think about which ways AI can save you time or give you research guidance. It's not going to solve your brick wall, but it might get you closer to maybe being more efficient or giving you that next lead to chase into. And just remember, AI is a tool, but it is not the only tool for genealogy, even in this digital age. Thank you, and we'll turn to some questions. Wow, thank you so much, Melanie, for that fantastic presentation. Um, just a wealth of information there, so many exciting possibilities. Um, so we have had so many wonderful questions coming in. Um, we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Um, so to start off here, Melanie, um, a question that came in is, could we use AI to help identify relatives or even buildings in old pictures? Yes. So there actually are different tools that are out there that I'll mention. So when I was at Roots Tech last year, and this was also at, uh, at NGS, National Genealogy Society Conference, um, there was different, there was a company that was looking at how to um, look at photographs of people to tell them apart. Um, it required searching their databases as well as um, uploading your own photographs. So when you know when someone is, you want to make sure you're comparing against the unknown. So you have at least some way of that control of knowing you know, here's a, maybe like a group photograph of everybody I've identified. Maybe here's another unknown one of someone younger. That might make it a little bit easier for AI to isolate because what it's going to do is it's going to try to look at the different factors on how the face is framed and all the different measurements that make up your face to try to match that. Uh, that company is called Related Faces. Um, it's relatedfaces.com if you want to check out. It's still relatively uh, new, um, but they actually have partnered with Family Search, and they actually are doing really incredible things. Um, in terms of old buildings, so there are different uh, companies that are doing that. Uh, there was even someone, I think, that did like a project where he had actually did a, a tool called Pigeon, for and CAPS for short, and he had actually... Um, found ways of identifying different buildings. Now you can use, you know, more advanced things like that, or you can even use that Google lens because Google lens is going to look at those landmarks, maybe in your photographs on your family vacations. It might be able to tell you um, at least with some good confidence, maybe what country it's in. And in some cases, some of these uh, tools can even get within like miles of a particular location. So yes, it is definitely possible. You just need to find the right tool that will work for the area and the time period that you're interested in. Great, thank you so much, Melanie. Um, another popular question that I see coming in is, can AI help me with indexing or um, creating citations as well? Yes. So with indexing, that's going to be a more intensive process because you're needing to probably, if, especially if you're doing like a big indexing project, 
that could take a lot of data and, and uh, computers that need to be set up. So for example, when we had the 19... Uh, 50, United, 50 census that was launched, that was actually done using AI to create that initial index um, to get it out there as quickly as possible. So it can be done with a lot of bigger projects. Uh, family search is using that obviously with the handwriting recognition to create those bigger projects as well. Um, and for citations, yes, there are also other tools too. So I had mentioned um, that there's a tool called Grammarly. Um, they actually have a citation generator that you can use too. Um, it can do formats like APA, MLA, and Chicago style. Um, and there's other ones out there on the web. You can just basically Google AI citation generator to see what's out there. Great, thank you so much. Um, I do see as well, a lot of folks are asking um, if any of these tools are free or if there is a cost associated, maybe you can just kind of give a quick summary on some of the tools that you mentioned. Sure, so when I showed like uh, ChatGPT, the current version 3.5, that is free. If you upgrade to 4.0, I think that's like $20 you pay. I don't know if it's, I don't, I can't remember if it's a monthly or one time. Um, Claude right now is free. Um, the MyHeritage tools come with a subscription to MyHeritage. And if you have the, and if you want further photo tools, there's the Reimagine app. That's a separate fee. Um, Google Translate's free. Uh, Google Lens is free. Um, so I've tried to show a lot of things that are available for free as much as possible. Great, thank you so much. Um, also a few questions coming in um, about whether or not there are issues if a document is hard to read, maybe you know some smearing ink or um, tombstones that may have worn away. Um, should that be a concern when using AI tools? It definitely can uh, distort your results because if you have a smudging or a not a clear image, the computer, it can only do so much. And if you can't do anything to clean that up, it may not give you accurate results or it can give you very fuzzy, um, you know, uh, recognition. So if it's trying to read something, it may only read a few letters of it. So I would say in that case, you may want to try to do your best to get a better image of it or try to look at a published transcription that was done maybe of that newspaper article or gravestone um, if it's not available and it's worn away completely. Um, to try to get that data, so. All right, thank you. Um, a lot of great questions coming in. I know we're in overtime, but we'll try to get to a couple more here. Um, so another one, Melanie, um, someone says, I've heard of plugins being used with AI. Uh, what are they and why should we use them with AI? Sure, so uh, a plugin is basically software that is enhancing um, that is enhancing something else you have on your computer. So you can have plugins that are reading stuff like if you are using the WordPress blog, for example, they have a number of AI plugins. It can be a way of to um, it could be a way of adding additional functionality onto it. So if you were trying to maybe add an AI plugin to help you with like grammar check or giving you suggestions on how to write posts, that could be something that you might want to use. So I would say you really want to research the plugins and see if what you're trying to accomplish is something if you need to use a separate plugin, which is adding it directly to your computer, or if you um, need more of an extension, which is actually maybe changing how you're doing something on a website. Um, or if you can use another tool to accomplish it maybe for free elsewhere. So I would say it really depends on what you're trying to do, but there are plugins for AI across many different areas. Great, thank you so much. Um, so then I did see we also had a lot of questions coming in um, about kind of more possibilities for what AI can produce. Um, I know we showed a lot of kind of narrative things today, um, but we did have some questions coming in. For example, can AI convert a large genealogical report into a family tree or a JEDCOM? Yes, it can. Um, th there actually was a, a really good article that uh, Steve Little had actually wrote on his blog. Um, I can even throw that in the chat. He actually talks about how he even does that. So, so the answer is yes. You do have to set up the prompt to 
do the format of a jet comp file. But for example, he was able to do something like where he did an extraction from an obituary like I did and then have a jet comp created from that. So sometimes you might have to do a two-step prompt to really get what you're needing. But I'll throw that into the, the chat so you all have that. All right, thank you so much, Melanie. Um, and I, unfortunately, I do think that's all that we have time for today. Um, but again, big thank you to Melanie for um, creating this excellent presentation and, and delving into all of these possibilities. Um, for all of you out there, if you do have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider hiring our research services team or using our chat service online. The chat service puts you in direct communication with a genealogist, and it is completely free and open to the public. Uh, it's available Monday through Saturday from 9 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And to access this service, simply go to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. Um, it's very useful. Um, I, I definitely recommend checking that out. Um, and I should note that we do not use AI for that chat service, so you will be <laughs> speaking to our real genealogists. Yes. And this presentation was done by a real genealogist, too. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so thank you again for joining us today. As you do leave the event, you will have an opportunity to fill out a survey and to give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of our members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to help keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you and others. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org. Best of luck in your research, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.